All right. Um, well, maybe uh, the best way to start would be, since I'm sure many people watching this won't know who you are, if not most of them, um, to just kind of introduce yourself to give, give everyone an idea of who you are and what you do. So my name is Jonathan Peugeot, and I am mostly an artist. I'm an icon carver, which means that I make images uh, based in the tradition of the church on uh, for churches, for individuals, um, following really kind of the canons, we would call it, the the standards of iconography and, you know, respecting the way that saints or that Christ or that stories have been represented in the past and trying to see in that a wisdom that's been passed down. And so, uh, and so one of the things that I'm doing as an icon carver is I also study traditional symbolism and try to see, you know, try to understand it, try to see what it means for us today, and also try to apply it to the, to the world today so that we can, we can understand these stories as being as giving us patterns which explain reality and explain our interactions with the world rather than just these arbitrary kind of strange fanciful stories that are from the past. Right, and that's, it's, it's really kind of great that with, uh, you know, looking at pre-modern literature particularly, but especially things, you know, involving saints and these other kind of mythological characters to kind of be able to approach it from that kind of symbolic and artistic standpoint so that it doesn't, you know, we just gloss over and say, oh, that's really weird. <laughs> I don't understand what's going on. Um, but actually try to work out, you know, what's happening and like what's, you know, because clearly these stories have have meaning beyond just, uh, you know, you know, people believe, you know, really weird things back. <laughs> these yeah, weird images. I, the, the most important thing to understand is that there are innumerable ways of dis, of describing reality. We somehow still have this idea that a kind of matter of fact, uh, very let's say kind of forensic way of describing reality, let's say the way that you would describe reality to a police officer if there is a crime, we have this idea that this is the standard of how to describe reality, but that is absolutely not the case. Most of the time you'd never, you don't describe reality as if you're describing a crime to a police officer. <clears throat> we use all kinds of imagery, all kinds of shortcuts, all kinds of compressions in order to compress large amounts of time into very short, uh, short stories. And so this is something which the ancients understood very well. And so the idea that you would have strange stories that somehow sometimes have strange elements to them, um, we, it's better not to understand them just as literary tropes or literary metaphors, but rather methods of compression and methods of telling stories which encompass things that are difficult to describe in forensic terms and contain more information. It's like, if I describe a, a let's say describe a boxing match and I say that guy whooped this guy's ass like that's way more descriptive than if I spend an hour describing every punch and at what centimeter from what muscle and what damage it did to how many blood vessels like one of them is more forensic but the other is more real because it connects to all the emotional all the meaning and all the the deeper aspects of why you would watch a boxing match in the first place right yeah and you get that interesting thing where I think often modern people find things like saints' lives really hard to kind of process, uh, especially and not popular at all. Like I mean, usually, it's like, oh, that's you know these weird religious stories. Who'd ever want to read those? It's un like <laughs> these were the super popular literature of the day in the Middle Ages and beyond. And there's and they straddle that line insofar as you'll, you'll have some which do seem to kind of they fit with our modern understanding of that kind of historical report. Like, so there'll be some that have no particularly fantastic elements in them and they're you seem to be fairly sober and then you get other ones where you know the saints being swallowed by a dray that's it's, right and it, it, yeah. especially the earlier it's like the further you go in the past and also the more the story tends to go down into the popular sphere the more it will have fantastical elements in it because those fantastical elements actually point to some deeper patterns in us that that tend to manifest in in ways that even though they look idiosyncratic are actually the best way to represent certain realities. Right, I mean, it's the, I, the, the story of the hero and the dragon, right, is so you know, kind of universal or even just even broader than that, just the hero and the monster or you know, what it, whatever it happens to be is, is just in every you know, form of storytelling in some fashion. So it's not like it's, yeah, some kind of arbitrary creation. Yeah, um, and, and even author. the fantastical versions that we have now, like there's a reason why things like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or fantastical novels are so popular, not just because they're flights of fancy, but because the, the storytelling tropes that they use connect to some very, very deep, you know, uh, patterns that we have inside us. And 
that kind of frame our reality. Right. And I think one of the things that I think is useful about looking at literature like uh, like Saints Lives, uh, these you know these kind of pre-modern ones, is that it it kind of removes hopefully a little bit of that gap between oh yeah there's these things we watch for entertainment like lord of the rings and harry potter that we like and they're you know we like fantasy right and then there's real life and which is you know not boring. like that at all yeah which is boring and, and not colorful at all it's just like that's that's such a such a modern understanding like a pre-modern culture just would not understand what you're talking about if you put it in those terms exactly yeah and the story of saint margaret is obviously a shining example of a story that has some very wild elements in it and uh, that it's it's important to kind of look at to and to help us understand you know what it says about her and what it says about why it was so popular like why people cared about mm. the story right and, and i think one of the things that uh, is interesting is to kind of understand how in in pre-christian culture you had what we might expect as that kind of heroic stories that were popular i mean obviously homer and virgil right you have the story of you know gods and demigods and these you know very martial masculine heroes and then you have this interesting flip that happens with christian culture where it's not that those things don't still exist and they exist in christianized forms but that you also have explicitly kind of christian stories which could not have existed before that period of people who die incredibly you know shameful in the eyes of the world uh right deaths of slaves and also may very well have been slaves themselves um, and that but they're raised up in this as a kind of laudable or admirable uh you know example of right action so in the, basically as a, as a hero and it's, it's very much often framed in terms of overcoming uh right some kind of foe even though that overcoming results in usually being tortured or killed um it's just it's such a it's such an interesting kind of reversal in a way it's, it's kind of, it's partially a reversal but it's partially participating in that same pattern of, of, of overcoming uh, the foe. It's just the method of the overcoming has shifted. Is different. And so right. in the story of St. Margaret, there are a lot of things in her story which really point to the things you're talking about within the story itself. You know, in the, the version, at least that I read, I don't know if it's, this is in every version, um, St. Margaret is actually born of pagan parents who mm -hmm. expose her to die. And so there, this was a practice which was in Rome, uh, in Greece, you know, in different pagan cultures, which is that, uh, especially if a girl was born, because a girl was seen as trouble, then the girl would be left out to die. Like, if, you know, when the father would see that it's a girl, then he would just leave her out to die. Or if it was someone who was slightly deformed or just in, in, a, in a wrong time, or there was, you know, it just wasn't the time for a child, then there was no moral they didn't see a moral problem in killing the child or exposing the child for, for it to die. And so in the story, what you have is Margaret is saved by a Christian person who raises her up in the faith to become, you know, a, a person who's very strong in the Christian faith and is willing to stand up and to speak out against the evils of the pagan world. So already, interestingly enough, you find, you find a, a contradiction in the simplistic way people, first of all, view Christianity and the way that they view, you know, ancient civilization uh, in general, where one of the aspects that Christianity brought to the world was a value, like a, a giving value to the feminine and a giving value to the lower aspects of reality, the slaves, the, you know, it gave a way for people who were marginalized in society before to now uh, to have a way to, to have a kind of power, a kind of power which is a spiritual power. Um, and so in her very story, you actually see what Christianity did to the pagan empire, which is to, to take that which was uh, thrown out by the pagan empire, take also women who were viewed as simply property in the pagan empire and bring it into Christianity, uh, where they, although people, for some reason don't can't see that this was what happened that they they became fully human and they were also uh for example like uh you couldn't in the pagan world you could marry a woman by just taking her whereas in the christian world uh consent became the rule for christianity is that a woman had to give consent in order to be married um and so the story of saint margaret has her being raised by a christian and being very beautiful very attractive and so she attracts the interest of a a kind of pagan king or some kind of pagan authority. And the pagan authority uh, wants to have her. And the deal is he wants to have her and he wants her to submit to his God. 
And, uh, and so those two things seem to function together, which is he wants her to submit to his authority and to the authority of his world, uh, the authority which he represents, which is this ancient pagan world. So St. Margaret refuses. And for that, she is tortured, she's imprisoned. All these things happen to her. Um, and, uh, and so he's torturing her in order to convince her to let go of her pride, to, to give in to him, to, to finally you know, just, just give up this futile fight that she's, that she's putting up and to marry him. Um, and so this is where the story gets very particular because when Margaret is put in prison, then she encounters this dragon. And uh, the dragon comes to eat her. Um, and so in the version that I read, the version uh, that, that, uh, that Mar gave me, she doesn't get eaten by the dragon, but the more ancient version, she does. She gets eaten by the dragon. And then in the dragon, she pierces out of the dragon with a cross that she has with her. And so the, kind of uses this cross to kind of break out of the dragon and to be freed from the dragon. Um, and this is kind of, it's like, it's connected with her fight to resist the temptation of giving into this guy, right? Giving into this guy and giving into his God, giving into his authority structure. Um, and then ultimately then, because she, after she, she frees, frees herself from the dragon, then the man comes back and then the torture continues until she is finally killed. Um, and there's a strange element too, like this is harder to understand. Like I struggle to understand it. There's a, the element of this, this character, this Christian soldier, which worked for the king. Yeah, and right. then it's, very strange. it's a very strange element. They'd be worth thinking about more because she, there, is a, a, uh, there is a Christian who works for the king and uh, he's the one who's actually told to kill Margaret. And, and, uh, and at first he doesn't want to do it. And then she says, you should, you have to do this. This is, this is just how it's going to be. And so finally uh, he kills her and then he kills himself. He yeah, like he commits falls suicide yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then they both die in, uh, in that moment. And so that's like a really intense, intense. Uh, I think I can kind of see what it's trying to bring about in terms of storytelling. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe we could get into it after, but first we need to talk about the, the dragon. That's the most, that's the most interesting thing. Um, and so the dragon in, uh, usually the dragon is a manifestation of chaos, you would say, or a manifestation of these lower aspects, which kind of rise up, you know, and, uh, and try to devour the world. And so usually the way it's represented, of course, St. George is the ultimate version of this, but not just St. George, but also the image of St. Michael killing the dragon or St. George killing the dragon is usually the idea that through, through uh, light, through word, through meaning, then the dragon is pierced and is, and is fixed, right? So imagine like a slithering chaos of, of things that you don't understand, that don't make sense. It could be your desires. It can be, it could be a foreign, a foreign uh, army that's on the border that's gonna attack you. There's all these different versions of what that dragon is manifesting, which is just this kind of chaos, which is pressing in and is going to, it's going to, going to devour you from underneath. You know, imagine you have all these bills that you haven't paid or all these problems, all these things that come up from below. And then through a, through will, through truth, through light, all these things from above, then the, the, the demon, the chaos is pressed back down and, you know, order is reestablished. And so that's usually the way that it manifests itself. But a, a kind of more interesting, oh, not, this story of St. Margaret shows us another aspect of the dragon, which is the dragon is really mostly the notion of extremes, you would say, of extreme something. So here it's the opposite. It's like the dragon is something like a tyrannical hierarchy, like a corrupt tyrannical hierarchy. And so instead of it coming from below, let's say, it ends up actually devouring her and it becoming like a prison. So you can imagine that for, for, for someone who is a marginal person who is on the edge or, or doesn't have power, then this, this order becomes like a prison. That's what that, and that's what she's in. She's in a prison. She has this king who wants her to give in to his authority, to give in to his God, right? To give in to the thing which manages his world. And she refuses. So the dragon, the prison, this call from the authority is all the same image, right? 
right? The, the, the dragon is just one version of the prison in which she is. And the idea, of course, is that through her, through her uh, dedication to Christ, to something higher, to something more true, then she's freed from that prison. Uh, she ends up being freed from the, uh, from the prison. And so that's exactly what's going on. So you can see it at all these different levels and you can see it as a personal level too. Because for example, the dragon of, of uh, St. George is often represented to people as the passions, right? So this, all these desires that contradict each other that rise up, you know, you can have all these, these contradictory desires in you that are tr ripping you apart that are devouring you, imagine the drug addict or a sex addict or anything that, that you could be kind of addicted to. Um, and, uh, and so usually that's what it, that, that's, that's the thing that it represents. But here it's kind of like the, the opposite of, of those desires. It's more this corrupt oppression that comes from above that is holding her in and that is imprisoning her, that she has to free herself from. And so it's, it's fascinating to see how the dragon is almost used in an opposite way but inside her, it's also the desire to give in, like her own personal desire to give in to this man who is pressuring her and is saying, you could just, if you just gave in to my authority, to this corrupt false authority, then all your problems would go away, right? And so she has this temptation, uh, which is different because it's not like she's attracted to him, right? It's not mm -hmm. like, like, a, like, a, like the image rather of a seductress who would come towards someone and then the, you know, the man has to resist his temptation. Her temptation is just the temptation to give in and to give in to the authority in order to stop the suffering that she's going through. So it's a different temptation, but it's a temptation nonetheless. Right, and there's this interesting aspect too in that we have this victory insofar as she overcomes the dragon either by yeah, bursting out of it with a cross or like in the uh, 12th century Middle English prose version where she just kind of makes the sign of the cross and then he disintegrates into dust. Um, but she's still in the prison and she's, not, I mean, she only gets that when she's let out to execution and dies. But that's so that's the thing is that it ultimately ends up being a form of self sacrifice, which mm -hmm. is what uh, saves her. Um, and of course, in in the Christian vision, the this is also the idea in general. The idea of self sacrifice ends up being the way you solve a lot of the problems, right? In the in the sense in this sense as well, which is that. The, the, the capacity to accept to suffer, you know, and so, so to not give in to something you know which is false and to not give in to something which you know which is a lie, you know, and this is, this is something which you see um, happen in the image of Gandhi or of, of different characters who, uh, or even like Nelson Mandela, for example, who accepted to suffer, you know, so to not give in to a, a corrupt authority and not, you know, a Mandela is maybe not the best example, but, but rather like the, 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 the person who just, who doesn't submit, but then doesn't necessarily fight back, but just becomes a, an image of someone who is strong and is holding in, holding on and doesn't want to submit. And then that has a transformational aspect for them, but then also for the world as well, ultimately. It's the whole image of peaceful protest. Like that's what peaceful protest believes is that you, you can transform reality through not giving in, but not also rebelling at the same time. Right, and there's this interesting, I think, idea of the kind of, I don't know, passive hero, if you want to put it in that way, of like someone like, say, Thomas More, which is narratized in A Man for All Seasons by Robert Bolt, it was turned into a, a movie in the 60s, of this idea of all he does in that story is keep silent, um, and then they imprison him and they kill him. Like, that's the story. And he's held up, uh, even, you know, even in kind of contemporary secular 20th century uh, West as this kind of figure to, as a heroic figure, even though he really, did, the whole point is in fact that he doesn't do anything um, and that he's just refusing to sign a document and staying in prison. Um, but he's still, there's a kind of, there's an activeness to that passivity though. Yeah. And it, it's also, you could call it something like the secret of inaction, like the secret of the pillar, right? The secret of the axis of a wheel, the and, and it's something about the cross, which is also showing this mystery of the cross, which is this idea that at the center of something is the sacrifice, like at the center of, of things. And this is something that ancient people understood very much, right? Uh, it's something that people understood. That's why they sacrificed animals. That's why they sacrificed people, because they understood that at the center of, of, of a world is sacrifice. And 
this is something that, for example, in a in a, just a basic way, it, it sounds all weird when you say it that way. But if I say something like, in order for your family to strive as a parent, you understand that the that the core of that is self sacrifice. Like if you sacrifice yourself for your children, then your then your family will will thrive and you will thrive, right through that self sacrifice. But rather, if you don't, if you act in just based on your own will and your own passions and your own desires, then, then you won't be surprised that after your second divorce and your kids moving from one house to the other, that your kids are gonna start to not like you and are, are, not going, to, are going to go in all kinds of weird directions. And I mean, it's like, don't be surprised because you didn't self-sacrifice in order for your, the cohesion of your group or your, the people that are with you to, to stay together. Right, and there seems to be a kind of separation. It seems like in pre-modern societies, whether that's kind of hunter-gatherer societies or even agricultural societies, because of those kinds of cultures, the sacrifice is really present. You know, you need to sacrifice in order to, you know, work the land. You know, you need to sacrifice, in, obviously, in terms of hunting, um, uh, it, to a degree. And so there's there's a kind of experience where you're you're living it. You're kind of living that pattern of sacrifice. Whereas if you're living in a modern industrial society, where you can just kind of, you know go to the store and get your pre-made food and kind of, you know, you, you become detached from this idea that like something had to be sacrificed at some point along the way in order for that to actually. Function. Yeah, exactly. But for us, at least it's easier to see it psychologically because maybe that's the, that's the crux of our existence because our, our physical needs are so, uh, you know, you know, are so taken care of that it's easier to see the, the need for a psychological, for self-sacrifice in a, in a psychological manner or in a personal manner. Um, and understand that, you know, that's the same for any relationship. Like you can't, if you go into a relationship, just trying to get what you can get from it, it's not going to be a fruitful relationship. You also, there is a, there is this kind of a mutual self-sacrifice, which needs to happen for any relationship to be fruitful. So I think that that's what, that's what you are seeing in, in, uh, in the idea of the martyr is that the martyr becomes a mythical image of what Christianity is at a lower level. And so it's sometimes it's hard to understand why these people would admire these martyrs because, you know, like what is going on? Like, what is this? Why is it so impressive to them? It's because it's like an extreme version of something which they experience at a lower, more common level. Um, and so that's why it, it was like their shining examples were these people who who are willing to suffer, torture, and all these insane things uh, in order to stay true to something higher, were willing to sacrifice themselves for a higher ideal. Um, and they would experience it at a lower level, right? It would be just like, okay, so, you know, instead of, it's, when I get my money, instead of buying, you know, uh, some beer, I'm going to buy food for my kids, right? Um, and so it's like, that's the, that's the level of self-sacrifice that most people would have had to deal with. I think this is a really important point because I, I feel like already on the, the level of dealing with martyr stories, right, the modern reader can really easily just be like, I'd never do, like, who would ever do that? Like, who would suffer these horrible tortures just to not say, like, these words? Like, what, what are the, why would you even do that? And if you go the next step up and, and go to visualizing it and being swallowed or almost swallowed by a dragon, then it's just like, well, all connection to reality has been lost, it seems. And right, it's like, what is this? I can't interpret this at all. Um, but when you put it in those terms, you realize like, oh, one, yes, like maybe you're not martyring yourself. I mean, martyr means witness, right? In that case, it's, it's a kind of, you know, in the Christian context is witnessing for the faith. But there, but it is even this kind of pattern, like you said, of, of you know, you, you're, you're wit maybe like a witness for your family or something like that, um, right? And the idea of the dragon in this case is a kind of tyrannical authority, but that dragons are usually symbolic of, you know, all manner of kind of, you know, like you said, chaos and passions and these kind of lower things. And when you put it in those terms, in a story like this, it doesn't just become detached from something that's, you know, more historical seemingly, but it's actually, it's, it's doing the same thing. It's just, yeah, like you mentioned, doing it in terms which we're not familiar with usually. Yeah. Well, in, in terms of authority, there are some interesting examples uh, that, that, that can help you to understand what this could mean. Like, I'll give you an example. I, I forget the name of the saint horribly. It's a Russian saint uh, in the Orthodox Church where this, it was a, an aristocrat who in her city, the, the, the priest was known to, to have affairs with women and had prostitutes and whatever in his home. And she, and she knew about it, right? Um, and so this, yeah, so you have a problem, which is you have this authority 
which is corrupt. And so on the one hand, it's like you don't, you don't want to rebel against the authority to kind of destabilize society, but at, on the other hand, the recognition of this corrupt authority. And so you'd also don't want to give in to the corruption that this authority represents. So the story has her going into the room with the priest and the woman while they're actually doing it and, and taking the woman out of the bed, throwing her out of the room, then turning to the priest, getting down on her knees and saying, Father, I need to confess my sins. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and so there are other versions of that like uh you know huh. uh, we talk about saint francis of assisi there are images of him doing similar things where someone says what about this priest who's living with a woman openly and he says he goes down and he says i'm not even worthy to kiss this man's feet and so he's like shoveling ash he's shoveling like you know uh, burning coals on this <laughs> head where all of a sudden it's like if he doesn't change his ways he's going to hate himself and burn inside for the rest of his life you know so is these images of, of how to deal with corrupt authority that can then show this how self-sacrifice can actually transform reality. Right. It's interesting because in the story, she's she has lots of invective against all these guys. She's you know saying, you know, you know, you're all gonna, you know, go to hell for this, and like no. you, your gods are false and what have you. But she at no point is trying to like, I don't know, incite a rebellion. And we see that coming back to that weird thing with the her Christian executioner at the end. Oh, she, she says basically they do your duty and kill me and even he i mean there's again there's a weird suicide at the end but the whole point is that it wouldn't have fit with the pattern of the story for either her to lead a rebellion certainly not but even for him to have kind yeah. of yeah and i and i think that the reason if maybe this is why i think that she was killed by this christian soldier is because the whole story is about not giving in to the the corrupt authority and so about a way to resist the corrupt authority. And so obviously the, 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 the image of the sword obviously has, does have some sexual connotation. You can't avoid those connotations when you read uh, kind of chivalrous uh, stories and, and, this, and the idea even that there, there is this relationship. And so in being killed by the Christian soldier, it's as if even in her death, she never gives in to the, to the corrupt pagan authority. Even though she has to die, it you know the story leads to a point where she actually never submits to this this pagan authority who is trying to dominate her uh, in a in a corrupt way. Right, and, so and, I think and that's and probably she, why they have the Christian the Christian killing her. Right, and her telling him to do it, so she accepts it. It's not. Yeah, and she ex she accepts that this is her fate, and this is how the story has to has to go. You know. Right. Well, and it's it's interesting because. See, so in a lot of ways, she seems to be a really good example of the feminine hero, right? It's the, the way that that kind of character approaches the battle with the dragon in a way that someone like St. George or, you know, in a more secular context, Beowulf or what have you is not going to do. Um, but at the same time, there are these kind of interesting markers of, uh, of a still, that still active sense. Like there's the part where she takes, it's not, so she's visited by multiple demons, the first one that looks like the dragon, then another one shows up and she throws him to the ground and puts her foot on his on his neck and like pins him there, uh, which is, so that's, you know, kind of violent and active, but I, but I think even that is participating ultimately in still a kind of symbolism of the feminine, even though it's a little bit more. No, you're right. And there is, but it's also not just that, there is a sense in which sometimes these, these stories, when it's like, when when it's relating to the also to the kind of foreign king let's say mm -hmm. there is there is a place for a a interesting active element of the feminine you know when it is like the idea of rejecting the foreign suitor or rejecting the the foreign authority so like that image of her pressing down her neck on the demon is in the bible there's a version of that which is the story of jail uh and so jail is this prophetess and this foreign king who's trying to invade Israel uh, comes to her, comes to her tent, and she receives him in her tent. And then she acts like a kind of a mother lover to him. She she gives him a blanket and she like gives him milk to drink. And so she has him, she puts him in this like comfortable situation. And when the king is asleep, she nails his head down on the ground with a spike. Have you seen this story before? The yes, story well, I, that's for, well, I had actually forgotten about it because I was thinking about uh, Judith and Holofernes where it's kind of similar. She seems like she's going to, you know, off. yeah. And then she cuts his head off. I had forgotten that it has this almost the same pattern in that one yeah. too, but with this, but with the spikes to the temple. That's right. Yeah. And so there is something about the idea of the, 
rejecting the foreign suitor in the sense of the, the, the one that isn't your husband or that isn't, isn't your authority or isn't your husband or whatever, that all of a sudden there's this activation that happens and it's like, you know, anything goes. And there's even like a reversal where she's acting in a, like she's penetrating the, the character. She's pe penetrating the, the foreign king uh, in a very violent and disturbing way. But I guess kind of to come back to what you're saying before is like before you have the societal shift in terms of you know the the relationship between masculine and feminine being based in kind of consent of in a lot of pre-Christian cultures the woman had to fight off the suitor right <laughs> otherwise he's his wife so there's that kind of like you said this activation of you know if if he comes to take you by force you have to violently fight him off that's kind of the way that you express your you know your proper nature I guess yeah and it's possibly like one of the reasons why they have it. Uh, because it would have probably it, it the one of the reasons why it's the dragon that she that she ends up physically fighting off is also to to solve the problem of like you know the problem of the the let's say the Christian martyr facing his or her uh, you know persecutor how there, it isn't proper for them to turn around and 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 be violent towards the the, the persecutor so there's all of that kind of going on in the story. Uh, which definitely makes it a very fascinating, a very fascinating story. Right. Well, and it's funny because like you said, yeah, she can't, she can fight against the dragon. She can fight against the demons, but she can't physically fight against the actual physical foes. And yet, you know, centuries later, you have, you know, probably the most famous, uh, uh, you know, female saint for a lot of people in the kind of the secular world, um, uh, Joan of Arc, uh, hearing voices uh, uh, from various female saints, one of which is St. Margaret. But there you have a very different kind of manifestation where you have, I mean, she's dressing as a man, she's leading armies, she's physically fighting against the English. Yeah. Um, but but then when it comes to her own version of, of her own uh, martyrdom, then she seems to kind of take a closer to, a, you know, a kind of St. Margaret role where she's not. Yeah, because she she's doing it also, the, the idea of, of Joan of Arc is that she's also doing it completely in submission to her king. Like everything she's doing right. is in order to save the king. And this is also the, the power of Joan of Arc is that she saves the king despite how he basically, you know, ends up uh, selling, her, selling her away to, to the English. And, and the reason, one of the reasons why she dies in the hands of the English is because the French king never bothered to, to lift a hand to save her. And so there's a tragedy in that in that story, um, but definitely like there's there is there's like I said there's room for these feminine exceptions that you see in the in the stories like the story of Joan of Arc is definitely one of them uh, where kind of she she joins these extremes together in a way that because she's also a virgin it's important that she's a virgin in the story it's like she's this virgin warrior you know she's almost she's almost an Amazon, like in terms of right. the symbolism, like she really is close to an Amazon, but it's like a holy Amazon, something like that. Right. Well, it's interesting because usually if you're looking at, uh, you know, things that are trying to find the kind of pre-modern uh, manifestation of the, the heroic feminine, usually the Amazons is where you turn. But if you read, you know, if you look at how they actually appear in the, the Greek sources, they're really nothing heroic about them. They're monsters. They're usually. monsters. The, the Amazons are monsters. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And so you can um, see Joan of Arc as a saving of that monstrosity, like a, a right. healing of the, just like Christianity always ends up including all the strange elements of, of paganism back into itself, but transforming it in a way uh, that is, that makes it also different at the same time. Right. So would you kind of conceive of then, if we're trying to think of, okay, what is the feminine hero or what is the kind of feminine manifestation of the heroic? would it really kind of be something that while it's participating in some of the same patterns as the masculine version insofar as it, it's some kind of overcoming and it can, could involve a physical aspect that there's still an interiority maybe to it that's kind of more emphasized i think it just i think there are different versions of the feminine hero and i think that the version that we get in saint margaret is the, the let's say the people resisting a corrupt authority right and so that which, and, and so you could see it in all kinds of guises, you know, and the, you know, the woman resisting a corrupt authority without, um, without herself, let's say, betraying herself or, or becoming the monster that she's resisting, you know. And so that's always the problem of resisting authority. And you see it in any revolution, which is the revolutionary becomes the monster they were trying to fight against. And so how, how does the Christianity deal with that? 
problem. And stories like the story of St. Margaret help us to see a Christian answer to that problem. Um, and so that's one version of the, of the female, of the feminine hero. The other version of the feminine hero is of course, the secret influence. Like the secret influence is one of the most powerful versions of the Christian hero, of the, the feminine hero in Christianity, which is the one who moves things outside of the story in a secret manner. And so right. if you look at how every single nation converted to Christianity, every early Christian nation, there's always a woman behind that conversion. And, you know, whether it's the Constantine's mother, whether it's Vladimir of Kiev's mother, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the, the wife of different of the Northern Kings in, the, in Western Europe, it's, there's always a woman who converts first, and then you don't hear about the discussions, you don't hear about them, but then her son, her husband, you know, Augustine, uh, the Cappadocians in Basel and St. Gregory, it was their sister. And so it's, a, it's just like, it's a universal Christian story of this, this kind of secret hero uh, that, that is actually turning the world without, you know, in a, in, a, in a kind of silent way. By creating, I always say it's like by creating a space, by opening up a space for yeah. then, the, then her male counterpart to act in, something like that. Right. It's interesting because even in the Germanic tradition, you have this sense of often queens or princesses being, uh, uh, they use the term peace weavers. The idea is that they weave peace. So, it's a, so uh, because behind the scenes, you know, whether it's through council, through marriages or what have you, that, that they're actually bringing kind of warring sides together, but you, you don't, they don't talk about it in a kind of explicit way. Yeah, but it's also, it's important because it's an important aspect of reality. And it's an aspect of reality, which because we are so, we have valued the masculine so much that we can't see it, right? We have destroyed the private sphere. We've made everything public. Everything is like this, you know, there is, we're reducing the private to the minimum. And so that was also in tradition, that was also the, the space of transformation that happened in, the, in, in a feminine, let's say in a feminine guise, you could say, you know, the, the type of transformation that happens the forming of the world that happens in the womb was something which manifests itself also at different levels of reality, this kind of secret change that happens. Um, and so by overvaluing the masculine, now we think that that's the only thing that matters. Like we think that that's the only thing that counts, that in order for, for example, a woman to have value, then she needs to act like a man, she needs to, 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 to do all these masculine things. And the other aspect, this powerful aspect of reality is discounted as being stupid and, and irrelevant. And uh, it's not, it's super important. Without it, the world doesn't work. Right, yeah, well, that's, and that's kind of why I really wanted to kind of look at St. Margaret, because I thought, well, you could look at St. Joan of Arc. I mean, that's also a really interesting, as we've already touched on, but it, it could be easy to just look at examples of the feminine hero that are very close to the masculine, as opposed to looking at one that isn't following that I mean, it is a little bit. Again, we have the overcoming of the monster, but uh, but again, like if from if you're looking at it from a kind of material historical point of view, it's like, well, she resisted the advances of this guy and then was executed. You know, it's not it's not like you know going out and leading an army and overcoming the villain, and you know, it's not like that at all. Um, and because I do think it does seem that we we don't it almost seems like society doesn't consider that heroic in the same way um, or like a, of the same value as the masculine traits of going out in the world and kind of doing something actively as opposed to kind of privately resisting something um, and the, even to the point of, of death in the end. Mm. Yeah, because most of the time in terms of dealing with corrupt authority, it, that's a problem most of us will have way more than conquering some other like something. <laughs> it's like we're all of us in terms of in terms of the people, we have a feminine role in, you know, compared to our authorities, compared to the police, compared to, to, uh, you know, to, to the hierarchy that, that's above us. Like most of the people you'll meet in your life all have a kind of uh, relatively feminine role to play in the social sphere. So we need to understand how transformation can happen in different ways besides conquest and all these kind of more, uh, let's say these images of these more masculine actions. Uh, so it's it's useful to understand this, or else, or else you know, then we will just be bitter and we won't be able to function in reality. 
Right. Well, it's, it's interesting at this at this time period, you know, kind of moving from the you know the 1100s into the 1200s and kind of the late Middle Ages of how there starts to be a, a little bit of a reframing about how these kinds of traditional stories, often originally oral stories, um, are received in terms of their kind of utility for the you know whether it's the polis or the you know, the kind of the community at large, insofar as like there's a time when these kinds of stories are massively popular in, in England uh, and in particular St. Margaret, I mean, amongst the laity. So clearly they realize this has, like, they're not just reading it for entertainment, although, you know, maybe that's an aspect, but they clearly can feel like they can get something out of it. But then as the uh, more kind of intellectual elite type, uh, you know, literate society starts in feeling like these kinds of stories don't actually reflect reality, um, right? Because there's not dragons in reality and they don't burst into, you know, dust and you make the sign of the cross with them. They start taking them out uh, to the point where in this, this already in this 1100 story, it's like, well, the demon looks looks like a dragon, but it's not really a dragon. And he doesn't swallow her, right? He just wants to swallow her. And then she makes the sign of the cross and it goes away. And then eventually they just start telling, stop telling her story altogether. Um, and to the yeah. point where she's, uh, you know, kind of forgotten. She's forgotten. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think that it's a this move towards it's kind of like the beginning of the pendulum swing, you could say, of uh, of modernity already in the 12th century. You see it starting, you know, how this this kind of this kind of move from hyper rationalism to irrationality that maybe finds its highest its highest easiest way easiest version to see in something like classicism and romanticism you know in the in the modern age these two these two extremes would start to manifest themselves because the problem is that this is why these stories are so important because they actually are a space of participation in which the more irrational fantastical elements of our psyche are integrated with the the story in which you can participate in, right? Because St. Margaret was seen as a person that existed, that you could look up to, that you could follow. Um, whereas now we have these weird extremes, which is, like I said, the on the one hand, the kind of critical historical forensic version of, of factuality, and then Harry Potter. And so then we have Harry Potter and this, and, and we have these two things that completely have nothing in relationship with each other. And the same person that loves Harry Potter will make fun of a story like St. Margaret, you know, uh, and so it's like in the ancient world, these there were spaces in which these two extremes of, of 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 participation were joined together in these more legendary stories, you could say. Right. I think it's a really important point because even though you can read a story like St. Margaret as literature and you could read it like you would read a, you know, a Harry Potter novel, at least in theory, um, there's a difference in terms of what it was meant for and what it was used for for the certainly for the whole period of its popularity throughout the Middle Ages is that you're it's not just a story that you read for entertainment right not only because you can get something out of it of kind of greater value than simply being entertained but also like you said this is considered to be a person who lived and this is considered to be yeah there's a reality to the story even if we don't see it that way that is participative that you're actually you can enter kind of into her story and in, in, uh, to a degree yeah, she would have had a feast and people would have right. celebrated yeah. and there would have been churches named after her and cities named after her and so it's like there there would have been a, a way to participate in her story and to celebrate her story that wasn't like the kind of weird uh the weird geeky cosplay stuff that you see like that what that isn't something that is kind of so weird and removed from reality that it's it's just like it it doesn't participate in life whereas celebrating saint margaret and 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 you know and and celebrating her feast and maybe having a procession or whatever it is that people would have done for her feast to to celebrate her was something that which was integrated into their into their let's say yearly yearly cycle Right, and there's a, there is a sense where a story like this, what it produces is something like, you know, an icon that you might carve that's going to have a different function than a story of a dragon, like, you know, Smaug and Bilbo or something from The Hobbit, right? That might produce art, uh, but it's not it's not the same because it's, its connection to reality is at a different level. It's yeah, like, like I did carve an icon of St. Margaret and, uh, and that icon, it was for someone whose daughter is named Margaret and uh and that is going you know and it's going to go into a room and she'll be told the story and uh you know it's her patron saint maybe you know that she'll she'll uh she'll have a special prayer to saint margaret in you know in her daily life and so 
that's a participative thing. And so it becomes a model for her. It becomes a, you know, it, like, a, it's not, like you said, it's not just something you buy uh, toys for and like that, that, you, that is just this kind of fictional world that you can't really live in. Right. And that's actually the idea of naming, I think is kind of interesting. I would assume that this, this story of St. Margaret is one of the, I think she's really probably the main source of most, you know, people naming their children Margaret is probably generally would be after her. Yeah. Uh, historically speaking. Um, and just how that's, that is a different process than the kind of thing now where it's, it's becoming more popular to name children after characters from fictional things, you know, like, oh, I'm going to name my child Anakin. Gandalf. Oh, yeah. man. The first oh, time gosh. I met an Anakin, I was like, dude, don't, what are you doing? What are you doing? Didn't you watch the movies? Didn't yeah, you exactly. Doesn't, this doesn't end well. This just yeah, doesn't end well. Right. Oh, boy. Yeah, but indeed, there is, a, like, this is some one of the points that I've been making for a few years is that there's a strange moment now um, in history where, on the one hand, churches are trying to be as close to entertainment as possible, Right, and, and uh, have taken up the concert model and using advertisement tropes and you know uh, popular music and all that. But on this, in the same, at the same time, uh, entertainment is trying to be more participative. And so you have people who, like I said, dress up as their characters, have cosplay events. There's something called the Church of Harry. I think it's called the Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, which is like a, a, an, an organization. They meet every week. And they have liturgical readings of, of Harry Potter books together. And they meditate on the meaning of Harry Potter. So it's like a Harry Potter church, you know, right. but you can't live in the world of Harry Potter. Like you can pretend and you can, you can right. have, uh, you can wear little hats and you can, you know, but, but in the end it's, 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 uh, there's, it's factitious and it's schizophrenic to try to right. live in a world like that. Right. Well, that, that's funny that you mentioned that because one of the things I think that is really hard to often get across, especially if you're trying to kind of introduce people the concept of kind of literary study, um, is try and make it clear that literature is not the same thing as entertainment. Um, there's crossover for sure. It's not like they're completely separate spheres. But the idea that we have, there's a reason why historically we have a distinction between literature as a kind of manifestation of culture in a kind of higher sense entertainment as just that that thing that we go to kind of you know have fun and uh, <laughs> yeah just to steam cows. off and to rest it's like it, it's okay. not necessarily uh not necessarily the idea of resting which most entertainment seems to to be part of yeah right yeah so um i think that's yeah, i think that's really really helpful to kind of put put the story in, in in all of these various contexts we've kind of gone through a lot of a lot of stuff, uh, but I think I think all of it is, is, you know, hopefully, kind of illuminating of of why why a story like this isn't just, you know, a relic of, of kind of the past that you can kind of you know forget as just silly or you know not relevant or you know it doesn't have any kind of you know we don't <laughs> and tell stories like that today. So how does it how does it relate to, uh, uh, to kind of you know the modern conception of heroism or uh, what it happens to be? But I think if you take all of these things into account then it really does form a pattern throughout. Uh, I mean, it's really explicit in the West, I think, in the Western literary canon, um, but, but even beyond that, um, of, of this, this is a kind of a structure of a story and how it, how it lays itself out and these symbols reappear and that if we understand how these symbols work, then we can hopefully apply it to other things that if you then go on and read Beowulf, totally different kind of hero, totally different kind of story, but the dragon is going to be somewhat similar in terms of what he means yeah exactly it's going to be it's going to be similar and it's also going to be something which can help you when you meet your dragon see the thing about the thing about the dragon is that it's it's if you give a specific thing like if you give a specific thing which appears to you as a, a manifest itself as a dragon it doesn't when you retell the story it doesn't have the same power right because it's not universal and so a lot of times what happens in these ancient stories is that is that categories tend to con contract, right? And so they contract to a point where it, they become understandable for a very long time. And so if, <clears throat> if you give something which is too detailed or too particular, then it, it has a limited lifespan, right? It, right. It, 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 so, but if you give something that has, that is a contracted category, then it has a much longer lifespan because it can, it can kind of cross through the, the ages. And so, you know, there are certain images, like a dragon is, of course, the one of the ultimate images that 
is a contraction of all kinds of categories of experience into this very powerful image. Uh, but you can encounter a dragon. It can happen to you. And then when you tell the story, you know, you can give the, the details of it, but sometimes it's probably better to, to use a mythical image because it's the one that reflects your experience of it the most. Right, right. It, it just it just kind of make you wonder how many of the stories that you know have maybe currency or popularity now, like how many of those are going to last if they're not participating in those kinds of patterns, as opposed to these more ancient stories which last for millennia. And yeah, like for, that's one of the reasons why movies might not last very long because movies are so type, like they're so the type of the movie is so set. Like if if you have a story about drug dealers and all these different things in, and, and, you know, in a few hundred years from now, they, they, those just might not be even understandable to anybody. No one would even know right. what it is that the movie's referring to. Whereas the stories which embody more universal patterns and are using tropes, which can span through time, then those will just naturally survive uh, in the long run because, because they're not so idiosyncratic. Right. I guess that's kind of what the, the, the purpose of the canon used to be insofar as like the texts which didn't have that got weeded out over time because they weren't copied down and then the ones that were copied down were the ones that lasted or the ones that had some kind of significance that transcended so like homer is you know relevant in all ages not just in you know, ancient greece whereas now we have this weird thing because we preserve everything um and you know and and also a lot of these hierarchies are broken down so the idea is like well you should teach something as relevant and as political and is is you know it's going to speak to some kind of current issue but like is that going to is that is that it's, have not, the same it's not going to last forever because one of the problems we're having now and it's a it's a uni, it's a big problem everybody's seen it it's the, the problem of the hierarchy of information is that we've created a world where information is a near infinite but attention is not infinite and so there is a natural way in which the, the information will lay itself out in a hierarchy to you. And that hierarchy will end up looking in a, look like a mythical structure. You know, it, it can be, especially now, like with the, the social networks and Google and search engines, it can be manipulated and it can be manipulated politically, which is happening. But nonetheless, the problem of a hierarchy of attention is something that you can't avoid. And it'll make it that, you know, the, 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 you know, the third series of some random uh, sitcom that no one ever cared about, like the third season is just, it's just not going to be easily in your attention span because it's so far, it's, there's so much to attend to that it's just going to vanish, even though it might exist physically on some server somewhere, it's still not going to, it's still going to be on the, on the fringe of people's attention. Right, right, exactly. And I guess it's kind of interesting that something like this, you know, like St. Morgan has been on the fringe probably of a lot of places for a long time now, but uh, through, you know, forums like this, I guess, I don't know, <laughs> bring it back into people's attention, I guess. Well, it's, it's relevant. It's, uh, it's relevant today. And also the reason why it was, it was eliminated uh, was maybe not the right reason. And so yeah. I think that as, I think that as postmodernism has its way and kind of modernistic thinking has its way, it's going to have a surprising effect which is going to be restoring some of these old stories that people discounted as silly, you know, just a, just a few decades ago. Because a lot of the level of that story is no different than the level of the stories in the Bible. It's like if you're bothered by the story of St. Margaret, you know, why aren't you bothered by the story of Tobit? And why aren't you bothered by, by you know, the story, the Leviathan described in Job or the Behemoth or all these monsters? And the fact that God says in the first in the in the first chapters of Genesis that he created sea monsters, it's like you're gonna have to deal with that stuff. You can't just you can't just toss it off to the side. It's coming back. Right. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and it's so much easier too. Like when you know, you, so you can look at the Norse stuff and you see the the Midgard serpent encircling the world, and instead of that being like, oh, that's just like a cool Viking thing, it's like no, that's like it's in the Bible too. It's in. That's pretty universal, my friend. That's right, it's pretty universal. Exactly. It's all over the place. <laughs> Okay. We have our own, we have our own serpent encircling the world. Don't worry. <laughs> it's out there somewhere. <laughs> it's great. All right. Well, I think this was uh, a really good conversation, I have to say. Um, and, well, I hope uh, it's useful. And uh, yeah, and to, uh, and I hope it will also be useful to your students.